You know, there have been many outstanding people of faith that have experienced distress, that have experienced discouragement, and that have experienced depression. Job, for example, in Job 3, says he, it says that he opened his mouth and he cursed the day of his birth. It says, he said, may the day perish on which I was born and the night in which it was said a male child is conceived. I wish I hadn't been born. That's what Job is saying. Moses fell down on his face after the congregation had complained against him, him and Aaron, and uh, they began to cry out to the Lord. And so Moses, I think, faced moments of discouragement. David, you could find psalm after psalm where David is disturbed by the situation that is surrounding him. For example, in Psalm 42, he says, My tears have been my food day and night. David says, I, I, I keep crying during the day and at night. And then he asks, Why are you cast down, O my soul? He asks again in verse 6 of chapter 42, Why are you disquieted within me? O my God, my soul is cast down within me. I'm so down because of the situations <laughs> surrounding me. We don't have to read anything from Jeremiah. We just have to know what his nickname was. And we know that Jeremiah struggled with discouragement. He's called the weeping prophet. The weeping prophet because God sent him to go preach to a people and prophesy to a people that God knew would not obey him, but he still needed to tell them what the truth was. And so oftentimes he spoke and he spoke and he was met with rebellion. Jonah says, take my life for me after the Ninevites repent in Jonah chapter 4. He says, it's better for me to die than to live. Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And I believe Jesus faced, certainly in the Garden, extreme discouragement and distress. It even says that his sweat was like drops of blood in the Luke account because he was so distressed about the situation ahead of him. And yet, even though we know that there have been great men of faith in Scripture who have faced moments of discouragement and distress and, and depression, if you will, sometimes Christians feel guilty as they endure the same feelings and the emotional mire of other great men and women of faith. You know, it, it is important that we rejoice in the Lord, that we enjoy His peace. Philippians chapter 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice, but it's also true that the Bible is candid about the reality of suffering and offers much wisdom and instruction about how, how to bear the burdens of suffering. And because we suffer, the authors of Scripture who have been guided by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit certainly have written about these topics so that we might find comfort and strength and instruction on how to get through these difficult times. In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter is a letter that is written to people who are suffering. It is about how to bear up under the, the difficulties of suffering. It says this in verse 6. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Bring your burdens to God is the idea. As, as Peter closes this book, written to people who are being persecuted and, and, and mocked and struggling in their faith, he says, cast your care upon God because he cares for you. Now he goes on to say in verse 8, be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, I think it's interesting that in the context of suffering is where we find that verse about how we need to be careful, because the devil is looking for an opportunity to break us. And sometimes in the midst of our discouragement and in the midst of our trials, that's when Satan begins to work on our hearts. And so in verse 9... Sometimes we don't read verse 9. Following verse 8, it says, Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. 
Realize that other people are suffering too. Realize that Satan can be resisted. Realize you must retain your faith and the devil's just looking for an opportunity right now in the midst of your discouragement to bring you down. And so we need to look at what God's word has to offer and instruct us so that we can get through these periods of discouragement and distress and depression because we live in a broken world. We see people that suffer from tragedy. They've lost husbands and wives and children and parents, family members. We have some not even with us today because they've traveled to a funeral so that they could go and honor someone who unexpectedly passed away on the operating table. We face times like that, times of tragedy. We face physical suffering like Job did. We face financial losses that just stress us out and burden us. We face physical maladies that uh, sometimes come along unexpectedly that make us sick, discourage us. And of course, we face persecution as Christians and sometimes mockery and sometimes difficulties as a result of our faith. And it's difficult for us. So even we may experience these things. And I'd like you to think about a case study. We could look at a lot of them, but today we're just going to look at Elijah and think about Elijah. Now, let's think about Elijah. I'm going to do an overview, and the reason why is because there's so many chapters about Elijah. Um, it would be a very long text for us to read the entire thing. I had I had Ben read to us 1 Kings chapter 19. I, I told him when we were in the back room, I said when I preached the sermon, it was, a, it was a little longer than expected, and so instead of them complaining about my long sermon, I just have you do a long reading, so they're complaining about you later. Um, I'm just kidding. Well, a little bit, but (laughs) trying to break it up some. But I want you to think about Elijah for a moment. I want you to think, first of all, about how deeply and richly blessed Elijah was by God. You know, God had Elijah prophesy during a difficult time in Israel's history. It's when um, Ahab was ruling as the king of Israel, and Ahab was married to a woman named Jezebel, and both of them were evil. Jezebel was a terrible influence on Ahab. She was a Baal worshiper, not a worshiper of God, and and Ahab just followed along with whatever evil her mind had plotted and planned, and so he was an evil king. And because he was an evil king, and because God was trying to bring Israel to repentance, who was being led by this evil king, Um, God was trying to get through to the people of Israel and to its king and did so in some unique ways. Uh, First of all, Ahab and Jezebel were plotting to kill the prophets and did kill many of the prophets. And so if you were a prophet during the reign of Ahab and Jezebel, um, there was a good chance that you were a prophet who had to be a prophet in hiding. You had to go somewhere where they didn't know where you were because they wanted a complete eradication of of those prophets who would be prophets of God and teachers of God's ways. And they wanted and preferred only the prophets of Baal and Asherah, prophets of false gods. And so there was a time when Elijah was um, trying to escape the threats of Ahab and trying to live just like many of the other prophets were. There was a time when Elijah um, was fed by ravens in 1 Kings chapter 17. Some people might remember that about Elijah. Elijah also, by the way, had pronounced a a period of time where there would be no rain. And so um, God tells him it's not going to rain for a period of time. Elijah uh, tells Ahab it's not going to rain for a period of time. There's going to be an incredible drought. And there was a drought. Um, And if you're the king and you have a severe drought and Elijah is to blame, you're not going to be very happy with Elijah. He's affecting the agriculture and the crops and and the animals that feed off of those crops. And so Elijah's in hiding. And while he's in hiding for a while and just kind of letting this drought play out to try to make a point to Ahab, he's fed by ravens in 1 Kings chapter 17. Can you imagine that? Um, Birds coming and bringing you little bites of bread and bringing you little bites of meat. Um, But he's experiencing that because God is providing for him in the midst of his difficulty. Then we find that uh, the brook dries up and um, Elijah goes to a widow in Zarephath. And the widow's jar, um, though she was down to her last jar of oil and her last 
a loaf of bread, she thought, the widow's jar continues to be miraculously replenished in the presence of Elijah and in the presence of the widow. And so he continues to be fed by this woman in the midst of this drought, this time of suffering. And so God is providing for Elijah. That's what I want you to see. God is making sure that his servant is provided for and cared for and, and proving that he loves and he knows what's going on in his life. Well, he heals the widow's son while he's there, so God answers his prayers in chapter 17. We also find that uh, Elijah calls for it to rain again. God answers that prayer which was a sign to Ahab that indeed Elijah was a true prophet. So Elijah is blessed by God, by providence. Elijah is blessed by God every time he seems to pray. It's being answered. And we also find a unique situation in chapter 18 where Elijah comes back and has a standoff, if you will, with King Ahab on Mount Carmel, which is one of the more popular um, accounts of Elijah. He comes back, and there are 450 prophets of, of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. And so that's 850 prophets. And Elijah says, you know what? I've got, a, I've got a competition for you. I've got a contest I'd like to propose. Since you guys believe that your God is powerful and you believe that this God is working, then what we're going to do is we're going to set up an altar. We're going to set up an offering. And I want you guys to pray to your gods and see if your gods answered the prayer, and I am going to pray to my God, and we're going to figure out which God answers the prayer. Well, the 850 prophets of Baal are up there on the top of Mount Carmel, and they put their altar there, and, and they pray to their gods, and nothing, nothing happens. The, the meat's just sitting there on the altar, just kind of getting putrid. You can imagine the flies buzzing around it. And, um, and Elijah begins to mock them a little bit, actually, and that's the sign of a confident person. When you feel like, even though you're outnumbered 850 to 1, you can make fun of somebody. You know, you better be careful if you're going to make fun of somebody that you're sure they don't have more numbers than you. They're not stronger than you. He says, hey, maybe you need to cry out a little bit louder because maybe your God just needs to turn up the hearing aid, right? Uh, maybe he can't hear you right now. Or Elijah says, maybe he's taking a nap and maybe that's why he hasn't answered your prayer. Maybe you just need to leave a message. He'll call back later. Um, he's, he's mocking them. He's confident is what I want to point out to you. And they dance around and try to do a fire dance. And they cut themselves and they cry out louder and nothing happens. Well, Elijah, again, very confident in the God that he serves, takes water. And by the way, if you ever have a cookout, I don't recommend this. But he pours water all over the, all over the wood, all over the offering. It gets everything really wet. And you know, it's not easy to burn wood that's wet. But he pours this thing until the water is just overflowing in the pit below, in the fire pit below. And then he cries out to his God and God immediately answers in the entire thing. It's just, it's almost to me in my mind, it's like an explosion. Everything's gone. God burns it up. Now, if that were me, and I had just taken on 850 people, and my God answered, and your God was silent, I'd be pounding my chest a little bit. I'd be saying, you bunch of fools. I'd be extremely confident in the God that I serve, and that would create more confidence in me. Elijah ends up having the false prophets executed. That was what the Old Testament law required. But what's kind of interesting to me is... After Elijah does that, well, it makes Jezebel pretty angry. These are all her personal prophets that he has just had killed, and he's just a prophet. She's the queen. He had no right to do that from her vantage point. And so she puts a warrant on him. She puts a death sentence on his head, and that's where things begin to change. When you read 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah, when he finds out that Jezebel wants him dead, which really they've kind of wanted him dead all along, but when he, he finds out that this is what she has said, that, hey, I want you dead by tonight, just like you killed my prophets, I want you gone. Elijah makes a run for it. 
He flees. He runs. He runs a long ways. He runs and he stops and he's fed by angels. Again, God is providing. And he says several things that indicate he's extremely discouraged and he just wants to die. That's what he says to God. I'm done. I'm tired of this. He hides out. He goes to a cave until God can talk some sense into him. You know, like us at times, Elijah, what we see from him is he goes from a spiritual peak into an emotional valley in 1 Kings chapter 19. And the sharp contrast from high to low, it's really astonishing. Here he is on the mountain in one chapter, 1 Kings 18, confident, reveling in a great spiritual victory, just stood up to 850 people. And then when you turn the page to 1 Kings chapter 19, he is running from this woman Jezebel. He's scared. He's alone. He's ready to quit. He's ready to retire. He's asking to die. And that's a huge contrast. But I think that you'll find in our lives that we sometimes have 1 Kings 18 days where we are confident and where we are bold and where we are courageous and where we are trusting And then we also have 1 Kings 19 days, days when we are discouraged, where we don't want to do anything. We'd rather just sleep and stay in the bed. We're not motivated. We're not zealous. We're ashamed. We're quiet. We're afraid. We don't do anything for the Lord. Why is this chapter, 1 Kings 19, why is this here in the Bible and why would we take the time to study it? Well, one of the reasons I want to take the time to study it is because of something that James says in the New Testament. James says of Elijah that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He's like us. We're not much different than Elijah. He was a human being who faced moments of positivity and moments of greatness and courage, and yet he was also a human being who could be down in the dumps and discouraged and distressed and depressed. And I think that there's something here in Scripture for us to learn. I want to ask you, first of all, can you relate to Elijah? I want you to consider the symptoms of his distress. One of them we find in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 2 and 3. Notice verse 2. Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I don't make your life as the life of one of them, my tomorrow about this time. So Jezebel says, I want you dead and there's a 24 hour notice for you. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. I want to ask you, are you ever crippled by focusing on the worst. Let me give you some examples. Oh, if that person gets elected, this world is just going to fall apart. You focus on the worst, and then that person you didn't want elected gets elected, and you go into a deep state of despair, discouragement, shock. Or, oh, these school systems, I just, I worry so much about my kids. Or, oh, all these kids in this world today, they are just terrible, aren't they? And I am so fearful for my kids' future. I mean, I don't even know if they'll ever find somebody to marry. I don't even see a good guy for my girls or a good girl for my boys. All the economy, it is going to tank. We're just just on the edge of the bubble right now. It is about to burst, and things are going to sink. So we think about the worst. All this city, we've lost our jobs, and so there's these high crime rates, and there's people carrying around backpacks with catalytic converters that they're stealing off of people's cars. What is going on in this town? You, are you ever crippled by, by focusing? Some of you are on Anderson, like current events page, right? On Facebook, you, you see these pictures of God. It is kind of scary. I quit doing something a while back. Uh, I, I quit. 
I quit watching what I thought was one of the scary shows you can watch on TV. I quit watching the news. <laughs> because it's filled with discouraging thoughts. It's filled with pessimism. I'm not saying just be ignorant of what's going on in your world today, but there's just a lot of things that make you start thinking about the worst sometimes. Elijah hears something negative from Jezebel. You're going to die. And even though he stood up to 850 of her prophets, even though God has sustained him for three years in the midst of a famine, he runs away. That one piece of news is the one that really just makes it click in his mind that I'm tired of this. Do you ever suffer from hopelessness where you just feel like I'm in such a pit and things are so bad, things will never get better? Well, that's where Elijah was. Look at verse four. He went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came and sat down under a, a broom tree. Some versions say juniper tree. And he prayed that he might die. And here's what he said. It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my father's. It's enough. I'm done. Nothing's going to get better. I'm finished, God. Do you ever go through moments of hopelessness where you just think things are bad? And I just don't think things will ever be better. Do you ever, and are you ever just physically exhausted from thinking about it? Because when we are anxious and when we are fearful and when we are hopeless and when we are constantly negative and when these thoughts constantly consume us, does it ever leave you up at night? And every once in a while on a Sunday, that's just the day where I see everybody and everybody's talking to you. And every once in a while, you get a little tidbit of, of, of bad news. Or maybe my wife gets a little tidbit of bad news. This happened a lot when I, when I used to have business meetings. Um, <laughs> sometimes you just something happens or something is said and just it just burns on you. And, and I used to tell my wife, because she, well, tell me what happened. Tell, tell me what, what's bothering you. I said, I don't want to talk about it right now because if I do, I'm going to be up to like three in the morning thinking about it. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Let's talk about it in the morning when I got time to like cool off. Things settle a little bit. But to kind of have that, that policy for one, because I want to think about things a little bit more before I say something I shouldn't really say. Um, but also because my mind starts to starts to turn. I, I think Paul, by the way, dealt with that. He gives this list of the ways in which he suffered, like shipwreck, and I was stoned, and and um, you know people beat me with rods. But he also says one of my other the other way I suffer is my daily concern for all the churches. Sometimes I'm just worried about people, and that. That stirs. I'm worried about these churches where I've preached. I'm worried about what's going on there. And that's true. And that's true when, when, when you care about your brethren, you care about what's happening with the church and things. It's true when you're worried about your kids. It's true when you're worried about your job and what's going on there. It's true when people say hurtful things to you in your family and among your friends. And so it makes us tired. And that's, how Je and that's how Elijah is. Look at verse 5. He lay down, he slept under a broom tree. An angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. He's sleeping. He's tired. One of the symptoms is physical exhaustion. What about this? Do you ever feel like you just want to isolate? People have discouraged you and you're, you're tired of dealing with people. And so you just say, I'm going to go hide out in my cave. What's your cave, by the way? You may not be in a physical cave, but for some people, you know, we've got a, a man cave where we go hide out or we, we have somewhere that we go and where we just decide, I just want to stay away from everybody. I want to pull the covers over my head and I don't want anybody to talk to me. And that's what Elijah does in verse 9. Verse 9, it says he went into a cave. Literally, he spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah, you were just on the mountain. You were just standing for me. You, you stood up face to face with Ahab before you had the competition there. And you told him, you're the troubler of Israel. You were so bold. Why are you hiding out now? Why are you in the cave? And so he's lonely and he is isolated. And then he also has this feeling of rejection. Take a look at verse 10. He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. 
Sometimes we say things like that, you know, I, I'm, I've tried to be so good and I've tried to be so godly. I don't deserve my spouse treating me like this. I've tried to be so good to work and I show up and I'm there. I don't deserve to be treated like that when I come into work. I've tried to be so godly, Lord. I don't deserve to suffer. I don't deserve the heart attack, the cancer. I don't deserve to lose my spouse. I've tried to serve you and you took this from me. That's how Elijah feels. And he says, I have been very zealous. The children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. There are other people who haven't done what you wanted them to do. And they're not as scared. They're not, there's no warrant on their head. There's no bounty for them. Why am I facing this? He says, there are people that have torn down your altars, killed your prophets, and I alone am left. So he says, and I feel like I'm the only one trying to serve you. Nobody else is. Do you ever feel like them? Do you ever feel like so alone in this world? And it just feels like you're the only one who's still trying to serve God and be sincere about it. And they seek to take my life, he says. Let me ask a few questions. I'm going to ask a series of questions. And I'm going to ask you if you can relate to this, okay? Have you ever felt alone? Like Elijah, have you ever kind of said that? I just, I just don't feel like there's many people who really want to serve God anymore. Have you ever felt alone? Have you ever felt afraid? Afraid for your life or afraid for your country or afraid for your family, afraid for your future? Do those thoughts ever run through you? Have you ever had moments where you felt extremely discouraged? I'm just so discouraged right now. Things are difficult right now. I just don't feel like anybody knows what's going on in my life, and I don't feel like anybody cares. You ever felt anxious? Have you had those nights where you can't sleep and where you're just really thinking about yourself or your family or your future, and you're just anxious? Have you ever felt beat down? If you've ever been in an abusive relationship, you certainly have probably felt beat down. He just mocks me all the time. He just puts me down all the time. Nothing's ever good enough. I'm criticized all the time. You felt beat down. Have you ever just felt tired of it? I just feel like I'm going through the same rat race every single day and you're just tired. What about, have you ever had pain from your family? Family ever mistreated you? Maybe when you became a Christian, did you have family members who mistreated you for just trying to do the right thing? You ever have drama in your family? You know, for some people, the holidays is a great thing. For some people, the holidays is an awful thing because it brings family drama. Because there's a strange family members, family members that won't talk to each other, that don't get along, that like to bring up the past, that like to needle us with little things and Oh, we've got to get together and deal with that again. Have you ever felt that? Are you still stinging from the pain of divorce? Or maybe the pain of divorce from a parent? You're dealing with strife? Do you struggle with a prodigal child? That bothers us sometimes. That weighs on us heavily when our, our children have left the Lord and we think about it and we're concerned for them. Do you ever feel persecuted? You're just trying to do the right thing. You, you feel like you're made fun of. You're mocked. You're insulted for your faith. You're ridiculed because of what you believe about Jesus Christ. Do you ever feel haunted about your past? And that's what bothers you. You did something or you did something, something that you're extremely ashamed of. And, it, and it, for some reason, you just can't stop thinking about it. You can't forgive yourself or maybe there's someone else who won't forgive you because of something you've done maybe a long time ago that you wish you had never done. You ever feel shame for that or regret? Or you have some skeletons in the closet that bother you? Or do you ever feel hurt? Maybe you've lost a job and you're financially hurting or you've lost a friend recently or you've lost a mate or you've lost a child. I'm asking you guys to do something that you know is totally taboo and you know, in, in the middle of a sermon. But I'm, I'm going to ask you if, you, if you can answer yes to any of these questions, uh, I'd like you to stand up. You stand up. 
So if you've ever felt this when. Now, I'm going to ask you to do a second thing that's totally taboo in church. Uh, if you're sitting up in the front, I want you to turn around and look. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. I know your parents told you you can't turn around and look, but I want you to look around. <laughs> we often say this, that nobody knows what I'm going through. But if you look around, there's a lot of other people that are have been through this stuff too. You can sit down. You've got brothers and sisters here who have been and, and maybe right now where you have been and where you are. And, and I want to tell you something. That's what Elijah needed to hear. God tells him in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18, something that I think is, is so important. He says, Elijah, he doesn't say you're not alone. I'm saying that. He just simply says this, I have reserved 7,000 in, in Israel. All whose knees have not bowed to Baal. Elijah, you're not the only one. And you may not be the only one who feels like this. So Elijah, I need you to get back in and, and do the work that I've called you to do. There's others here who have felt alone and discouraged and persecuted and haunted and hurt. And it may not be the exact same pain as yours. I'm not suggesting that. We've all got unique experiences. But there are people here who, despite that, and in the face of those trials, you still believe that God is good. And you are here because you trust in the goodness of God. And you believe in God's power to change the situation for good. And you assemble together because you find strength in God and you find strength in one another. So I want to think with you about God's steps to healing Elijah. God's steps to healing Elijah. What would our society recommend for Elijah? If somebody was going through those same symptoms, what would they recommend and perhaps some of the recommendations would be um, some type of a medication. I, I, and by the way, I'm, I'm not opposed to medication. God gave us medicine. I'm not opposed to counseling. God gave us counseling. I've certainly recommended counseling to people. Not opposed to those things. God, God gave us wisdom, wisdom to work with nature, to work with the things of nature. And um, certainly those are things. Elijah may not have had access to some of those things in his time. Some people suggest, though, what I would su suggest to you are wrong things. Somebody's down the dumps and, and your girlfriend says to you, well, let's just go shopping. Yeah, put yourself in some more credit card debt. That's going to that's gonna make you feel better when you get the bill, Right. You might feel a little better about yourself when you put on a new outfit. Everybody does. You, gotta, you stand up a little taller. But I don't think that's a cure-all. Sometimes one of the boys says, oh, you're discouraged, you're down. Let's just drink away your sorrows. Let's just go to the club. Let's go to the bar. Let's just have a beer or two together. Let's just get high. That's how we'll handle it. And look, when you wake up, you've got the exact same problems going on. They're still there. That's no way to handle it. They, these are things that people sometimes suggest when we're struggling. Some of them have their place. Some of them are sinful solutions. But look at God's steps to helping Elijah. Just some things to, to think about when, when you are dealing with these problems or when others are. And one of them is this, patience. God is very patient with Elijah, and let me demonstrate why I believe that. Elijah runs from Jezreel, that's where he was when he gets the notice, and he runs all the way to Beersheba. Now, those are just two words that are hard, hard to pronounce when we read it, but those are two cities that are 95 miles away. That's a long run, isn't it? 95 miles on foot, there's no planes, there's no cars. Then he runs from Beersheba to the desert, and that's a day away, another day's journey, the text tells us. And then he goes from the desert to Mount Horeb, all right? That'd be about 150 miles. How long does it take when you're just walking or maybe 
quickly walking because you're afraid. How long does it take to travel nearly 250 miles? It's going to take a while on foot. It's going to take at least over a week if you're, if you're going kind of a marathon a day. And so God never says a word during that week. And I think that's important. God doesn't immediately rebuke Elijah. God lets him go ahead and run and work through some of his thoughts. And I believe we also have a God who's long-suffering toward us too. And, and so God is patient with him, and sometimes we need to be patient with others. These problems aren't fixed like that. Our discouragement isn't just fixed overnight, not just with a quick talk. Sometimes it takes time to work through some of these things. Let me notice a couple of things that God allows Elijah to do while he's struggling. He lets Elijah rest. He lets him sleep. Take a look at 1 Kings 19, verses 5 through 8, and it says that he lay and slept under a broom tree. Sometimes we do need to rest. Sometimes the mind is exhausted, the body is exhausted, and we need to sleep. And God lets him sleep. But... An angel comes to him and touches him and says, arise and eat. Sometimes we need food. We need nourishment. We get physically and emotionally spent. Jesus knew this too. Can I suggest to you that sometimes, notice Elijah doesn't prepare this for himself. Sometimes we need to provide food and nourishment for other people who are going through a difficult time. Is that maybe why when someone has lost a loved one and, and after the funeral people bring food? It's, it's because they're very busy in part, but, but it may be you can get to a point where you are so discouraged and, and so depressed, you don't want to make food and you may not want to even eat. And so the angel provides food for Elijah and says, eat, you, you need to eat something. The human body has its limits. And perhaps for Elijah, he had, he had kind of maxed out those limits. Sometimes we need a break. That's a simple point that I would make. When you're feeling burnt out and distressed, sometimes you need to take a break. I appreciate the elders here who have told me a lot of times I've had vacation and there's been a lot of years I don't take my vacation and work through. I've taken a lot of time off this year because of COVID and, and gospel meetings. But the elders when I came here said, you know what? I, we want you to take your vacation. You need a break. And they said, we need a break too sometimes. So we're going to be gone too every once in a while. And that's true. You, you keep on trying to uh, cut with a dull axe, you're going to work a lot harder and you're not going to get as much done. So you've got to sharpen your axe sometimes. You know, that's, I think, what Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 10 is implying when you look at what Ecclesiastes says. It says in chapter 10 and verse 10, uh, if the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength but wisdom brings success. And sometimes you need a break and you need to recharge, you need to rest, and you need to get nourished. What else does Elijah do? Well, God finally gets to the point after he's let Elijah run, after he's made sure that Elijah is fed and he's allowed Elijah to get some rest, because sometimes you don't think clearly when you're not well rested. Then God says, let's have a conversation. Okay, now I know that's not what specifically God said. I'm not quoting, but that's what's happening. Look at chapter 19, verse 9. He went into a cave, he spent the night, and notice what Elijah or is asked by God. What are you doing here, Elijah? I think that's really important. God doesn't say, you know what, I'm really ticked off at you, Elijah. I've taken care of you all this time, and here you are hiding out. There was none of that from God. There's no accusations. Sometimes we do that when people are struggling and we make the situation worse because we run them down in the midst of a difficult situation. God's steps for healing Elijah is he asks an open question. Can you tell me why you're here? I think those are questions that we have to ask to our brethren. We see that they're wearing their emotions on their sleeves sometimes, that there's down in the pits. Hey, what's going on with you? And really mean it. We need to have conversations that are more than just conversations as we pass one another as we head to our cars, to the, as we head to, to lunch. Sometimes you need to call somebody up and say, you know, you didn't, something didn't seem right. Are you okay? 
Sometimes people aren't here. And that's an indication that something's not right, that something's not okay. And you need to pick up the phone and say, are you doing, are you doing okay? I haven't seen you for a while. What's going on? I mean, you just ask questions and, and have a conversation, get a cup of coffee. My, my wife, I put her to work sometimes on people and I say, you know what, you need to have this person for a cup of coffee and talk to them because maybe I don't have time this week. And she's really good at that. Just open up a conversation. But we need sometimes to talk about it with a friend, and that's what God does. There's no better friend than Jesus. We sing the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. James 5 and verse 16 says, Confess your trespasses to one another. We should be able to talk to one another, but part of who we can confess to, part of who we can cast our burdens upon is the Lord. The Lord who lived here on this earth, who had friends deny him, who had friends betray him, who suffered physically, who suffered emotionally, who was extremely lonely in the garden just when he wanted somebody to pray with him for one hour. He couldn't find a single disciple to stay awake to be with him. Our Lord has been on this earth and suffered and faced the same trials and temptations as we have, and we can pray to him. And so we should have one another. We also have him. And then I want to also say that Elijah needed to hear the voice of God. Look at verses 9 through 13. He says, what are you doing here? Elijah says, I'm the only one serving you in verse 10, basically. Verse 11, God says to him, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. A great and strong wind tore into the mountains, broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind came an earthquake, the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. I think the Lord gives Elijah uh, three consecutive signs to prove his power and that he's the one who needs to be listened to in the situation. And then you notice verse um, 13. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle. He went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And a voice says, what are you doing here, Elijah? God speaks to him. So often, when we are facing our trials, sometimes we're listening to bad advice. We need to be careful of that. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, Jeremiah who was teaching of people who were listening to bad advice and they weren't listening to him. Jeremiah says in chapter 10 and verse 23, He says, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Sometimes the bad counsel is not coming from other people. It's coming from our own broken hearts. We're bitter. We're holding a grudge. We're angry about something. And we think to ourselves, this is how I will handle it, instead of considering how would God have you handle it. And so I would suggest you make sure that the people who are counseling you in the midst of difficult times are people who have, or people who know God's word and who have God's word in mind as they counsel. Because we can listen to bad advisors. We can have bad counselors. And that confuses us. Hear God's word, hear wise counsel. Because God still speaks to us through his word. And then I would also suggest to you that God wants Elijah to get back to work. There's a time that we do need to take a break, that we do need to rest, we need to reflect, and we need to recharge. There's a time we need to get away from it all, and maybe time to isolate, just calm down. But after a period of time, Elijah is told, verse 15, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazel. Verse 16, then anoint Jehu. And then he says, basically, uh, Jehu is going to kill some people who, es- who escape, who are looking to attack you. It, 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 the people who escape, um, Hazel, Elisha is going to kill, who's your predecessor. I think the whole point of that is that you will be protected. There are people who do want your life, but God is saying, but I'm going to make sure that you are protected. I'm going to make sure that when you go back to work for me, that just like I always have, I'm going to continue to bless and protect you so you can do that work for me. And so what's the point of that? Well, the point of that is God's telling him, I'm still in control. I'm still in control. You think you're the only one left serving God? You're not. 
that I'm still in control. And then he also mentions there is going to be a time when you are done and someone is going to replace you. His name is Elisha, but Elijah is going to have to tutor him for a while. God's in control. God will find men and and women to carry on his mission. So while that's happening, though, we've got to keep moving forward in the work. So there's a time that we've got to keep going, keep evangelizing, keep edifying, keep working for the Lord and serving others. And Elijah needed to know that. Those are God's steps to healing Elijah, at least in part. Know you're not alone and realize that God is in control. There's a passage I want to consider with you as we close, and it's Psalm chapter 139. And just notice the a few verses here. This is David. And David says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all my ways. There is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. A simple thing I want you to learn from this passage. It's written by David. David who had Saul chasing him. David who himself had to hide out in the cave sometimes. David who was distressed. David who got so afraid at one point in time that he was, he, he was in a city where uh, he was afraid people recognized him. He pretended he was crazy on purpose. Spit all over himself. Drew it all over himself. I mean, he was incredibly distressed. And yet David ultimately comes to an understanding after Saul is defeated, after he is uh, appointed as king, after his kingdom grows and succeeds, David realizes that he has a God who knows and cares for him. And that's something we need to realize as well. Even though God has us go through the trials and the tests, our God knows us. He's not going to allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, and we need to believe that our God can help us. Now, let me close with this final thought, and that is that sometimes, sometimes we're struggling and we're discouraged because of our, our own sins. And that's one of the reasons we're here today. I think many of us, we're here because we realize we have a God who will forgive and has forgiven us of those sins. And if you're someone who's not come to that realization yet, that's one of the reasons we find peace and rest in the Lord. That's why those words are so meaningful. Because God is willing, by sending his son to die on a cross for you, to forgive you of all of those past sins. And he has promised you that even though other people might bring those things up, might try to stab you with them, might hurt you with them, God has promised you your sins and your iniquities, I will remember no more. I've put them in the past, and now you can start living the way you've always wanted to live for me. I've got something better for you. So don't think about what you've done in the past. Start thinking about what you will do for him in the future. Let God forgive it. If, that's your, if it's your sin that's bringing you down, let God forgive it and wash it away so that you don't have to despair any longer. Why should you believe in Jesus? Well, God gave Elijah signs to reinstill confidence in the God that he was serving. And likewise, God has given us signs. Isn't it interesting? Elijah went into the cave and he came out revived. It might be a picture for us looking ahead to Jesus who died and went into the tomb alone and came out as the savior of all mankind. God took his broken son and turned him into the world's greatest healer. And he can take your brokenness too. He can use it for his glory.